Welcome back to episode 440 of RX Radio. Throw it against the wall. What you just heard was the thing that has been screwing up my video on the podcast remotely for some time. And Lundy and I just got to the bottom of it. So now it's, it's going to be burned. It's going to be put in the earth. And we're going to salt the earth so nothing ever grows there again. I can't tell you how frustrating the last seven years of my life have been in recording a podcast. There is a statistic, and I've said it eight times now, and I'll say it nine times, and hopefully not a tenth, because I think we have confirmation that this is the intro that'll actually work. Something to the effect of 95% of podcasts don't make it past the first five episodes. And do you know why that is? Because the technical glass ceiling is so abrupt that it's just so frustrating that none of these softwares ever work and the quality is bad and something will work once and then it like doesn't work again and you plug something into the wrong thing that plugs into the other thing and like that doesn't work and you got to do it 10 times the night before. So here we are the night before getting the intro out in almost real time. I should have just done this live for fuck's sake, but here we are. I digress. What an intro for Reese Livingstone. Thank you, Reese, for uh, donating your time to the show. Uh, for those of you, for those of you know and know Reese, for those of you who don't know, you should get learned about Reese Livingstone, uh, serial entrepreneur and business owner in the health and fitness space. Guys, cut his teeth in every aspect, and now his interest is in the scalability of quality and service, driven by uh, data, which um, he talks a lot about today in scaling business operations. He talks about his own business, how he is still intimately involved in the processes of uh, you know high level business operations in his business, which we both kind of zero in on is an important attribute for those of you out learning business. The current business landscape is really a lot of five-year-olds teaching four-year-olds. Uh, you know, Reese has been around for some time and has uh, been a, a friend and mentor and consultant for myself in the business. Uh, so can't say enough good things. Uh, he is actually going to be hosting us for Prescript Level 1 in Melbourne mid-January, January 13th, 14th weekend. If you guys are uh, you know, in the area, if you're in the neighborhood and you see that our light is on and want to stop by, uh, basically, if you live on the island continent of Australia, or you're from Tasmania or New Zealand, or you really want to escape the cold and fly to the other side of the world, please join us. Um, James Mack, Jordan Junta, uh, and potentially other Prescript friends for uh, the Prescript Level 1 in person. If you've already registered, so Prescript Level 1 next semester is up online. Um, it's only a couple hundred dollars more for the in-person event, which you also get the uh, the digital course to follow. So we focus primarily on the hands-on things that we can only do uh in the flesh and then we worry about the theory stuff online which will start uh two weeks after uh you get your manual in person uh, and we get to hang out for a few days in melbourne great city um so shout out to everyone who's already registered very excited for those of you guys looking to register www.predescript.com if you go to live events or in-person courses click on the melbourne tab should be the only one up currently um and you guys can register for that like i said january 13th 14th at uh Lionstone physique. Uh, so huge shout out to Reese for uh, offering up the space. It's going to be a nice private facility for us to kind of play around in for two days, have some fun, learn some stuff, talk some shit, mostly talk some shit. Um, so looking forward to see you guys all there. Like I said, up for sale now. We are running an early bird discount that will expire in the middle of December. Uh, so it's December 6th. We'll probably be about a week or so next Friday. That'll uh, go away. So if you guys are looking to jump on it, jump on that now. And then uh, Jenta and I will be booking our flights shortly after. Uh, so look forward to seeing you guys all there. Huge thanks to Reese for his time and obviously the generosity of offering up the space. Um, so guys, I hope you enjoy the episode. A lot of good takeaways. Uh, if you guys have questions, feel free. Reach out to Reese. All that stuff will be in the show notes. Guys, enjoy. We'll see you next week. You're tuned in to RX Radio. Yeah, people use the hashtag, uh, well, what is it? I... Y K Y K. If you know, you know. Oh, and that shit confuses It's almost yep. as if, yeah. Well, that's what it means. Uh, T L D R. Too long didn't read. I learned that one the other day. <laughs> I just thought people were just being rude and just typing random shit on my captions I read on Instagram. Um, but no, it's you. You have become a a, uh, a a point of almost like signaling where it's like I can tell, and I do this with coaches that w that we interact with, that we that we contract with. I I like them to know you know, current players in the space, as far as like training goes, like, if you don't know, 
uh, like if you don't know who Charles Poliquin is, for example, like probably not someone's going to resonate with our culture, our, our mode of thinking, our delivery of our content. So it's like a pretty telling of like, you know, who did you learn from? Who do you know? Like who's in your network? And I, I'm always, if there's a commonality or a common trend, a common denominator, if you will, of like hyper successful people in the industry and the person that we kind of know together, like a, a mutual friend, it's you. So you kind of become this like oracle behind the scenes that not many people realize because I think you've done a really good job so far. And, and I'm assuming it's by design because everything you put your mind to, it seems to come to fruition. And if you wanted to be, you know, if you woke up tomorrow and were like, I want to be like super, super Insta famous, you would do that. So I'm assuming your current outward projection in the industry is very deliberate in its uh, relative anonymity. Now, you know, we talked off air and that's changing. Um, but yeah, you've become a common denominator of success in the industry. And I thought you've helped me out a ton uh, and just soundboarding ideas at a, at a high level for the business. Uh, Reese, welcome. Thank you so much for, for making this happen, man. I appreciate it. Man, thank you for having me. I, I appreciate the time. I appreciate that introduction. It's uh, something I'll do my best to to live up to. But yeah, I th it's definitely by design. The the anonymity behind the, uh, the the business process and stuff has been something that for me has been something I've played cards close to the chest. Um, and more so because I just don't fucking like spotlight. Like it's always been a thing of I, I don't really, I don't j I don't gel with attention well. Um, I like to just do my thing. I like to sit in my my office and not have to um, deal with much problems. And I feel like with awareness becomes more problems generally. Um, but yeah, it's been a cool, it's been a cool journey. I think like the, the mutual friends that we have, the mutual connections across the way, as far as just being a part of their journey and part of their process, it's been fun. It's been really cool to talk to people that are on the same journey. I think largely the main reason I do what I do is to actually uh, meet and talk to people that are like-minded and if they have some problems that I can help with, then great. Uh, but if not, it's a friendship at the end of the day and we can, we can gel with that and we can G forward. Now, like run it back from the beginning because I, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't even know of the mutual friends we have that, that anyone has really has pictured has pieced together the full origin story of like how you became kind of like the guy in the middle of a black hole with a flashlight for a lot of people. It's being like, Oh, where's the switchboard? Oh, there it is. Lights on. It's like, okay, where did like, how did this, how did you get into this shit? Uh, man, I, we roll it all the way back, uh, to the, we won't go the too long, didn't read version. I'll give you the full thing. Um, we, I started like 2012, 2013, got straight into the fitness industry, started in, in a commercial gym in a good life. And like most in a commercial gym, I struggled, I drowned and the system wasn't very well set up for success. Uh, but the one thing it did teach me was that, you know, you have to, you have to do the reps, you have to do the thing. Uh, and I did a lot of the thing without a lot of payment for a very long time. And I think I signed my first client maybe somewhere between four and six months in. I signed her for $25 and her name was Tegan Dimble. I still remember that was the first person that ever paid me. And I, I, yeah, I just kind of built the skill set, man. I built the, I built the reps in the gym and actually did the coaching stuff before I ever did the, the, before I even knew that I could run a business, I actually had to figure out that what the fuck is a business. And I think that's where a lot of people in that industry, maybe they don't realize it until it's too late where they feel like they have to actually start learning how to swim. Uh, I was very lucky. I did that early because I failed lots. Did that for, I'd say three to four years in the same capacity, built up to maybe 70 odd sessions a week. And then realized that time became the enemy needed to figure out a way that I could start uh, leveraging my time a little bit more efficiently. And that was where the online coaching started to come to fruition. And back then it was pretty early on. So it was quite an easy road to take. Um, a whole lot of luck combined with a bit of like good timing and we'll call it strategy, but it just realistically at the time was just looking at objective data and figuring out, well, what direction should I take? That's, uh, that rolled forward into, uh, the online coaching space. And I've realized the same thing at every point of business. I've realized the same thing that time becomes the enemy eventually. And I needed to hire out or at least outsource some of that time to someone else, buy some staff, uh, and just pretty much rinsed and repeated that until I could exit myself from the business, no longer coach and just focus on the growth of the thing moving forward. So currently as the business stands, for those unfamiliar, you oversee a team of coaches that have you know, numerous clients underneath them. And it's you've grown it to a point where, as you mentioned, it's kind of a turnkey operation now. 
for yeah, coaches yeah. that are looking to scale into that model, which is, you know, and I want to dig in, dig in on this a little bit later on the more personal side of like, you know, looking at time as an enemy is a really, really interesting turn of phrase because it's like, I, I mean, I definitely understand the race against the clock mentality and there's only a certain number of hours in a day, but you, you seem to free up more time to just see how far you can push the needle until you don't have any more time left and then just count the score when you get there and see how far you're at. But I'll, I'll digress on that and we'll, we'll circle back to it. For coaches now, because I think one of the things that I struggle giving advice with from a business development standpoint and just recounting my own journey without really any principles, I'm just like, I don't know, I just fucking did shit, said yes to everything, went homeless for a bit, hopped on an airplane, went all around the world a couple of times, and here we are. I don't know if I would give that same advice now. Like, you know, it's almost like a LeBron Jordan thing. Where it's like, well, it was a different era then, you know, like you're talking 2012, getting into the gym, you know, five years after that, you're getting online far before anyone else is. What, what were some core principles that you learned of scale as you moved into the digital space that rang true from your, the, 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 uh, the onset of your digital business? And what are some unique challenges that are, are, may, might contrast that in the current landscape of business development today? I think at the, the, the North Star here is you need to look at business from a perspective of you don't build wealth from what you do, but what you own. So starting your business journey to build something that is actually somewhat sellable or at least uh, repeatable and systemizing, because at the end of the day, if it all it depends on is your workload and all you do is like trade time and just continue to do so, you can no longer, you, you know, you never have an exit plan. So if you have a North Star, even if you never never sell ever, but just have a North Star of like, okay, what can I build to own rather than build to work? It will govern a lot more decisions. And that being said, with some of the integral places across the business, like I, I put a lot of time into you know, actually systemizing the way I programmed. For example, like at the time when it was just me and I was coaching, uh, before programming and biomechanics became a, you know, a term of, I guess, commonality in our industry where people started to respect it, I started to actually uh, break down the way I programmed and whether the methodology at the time was right or wrong, it was a methodology nonetheless that I, I could stand by and I could actually systemize and go, well, when I program, I do X, Y, Z. How do I do those things and how long do those things take? And then I could time order against them and every single task in my business was a reverse engineered down to the idiot level skill set. So someone, anyone could come in and plug and play so that it was a step-by-step -step process. And I think that's where the most integral thing for me would have been actually systemizing and creating a standard operating procedure for every task, even the most medial of ones. So for example, back when I was working in the gym, I would systemize my approach to client, uh, like client inbound uh, conversations. So when someone would come up to me, how would I talk to them? What would I say? What were the topics of discussion? And doing things in that way has allowed me to take a bird's eye view far quicker, far faster and allowed me to, in the infancy of the, the growth phase of the business, I didn't have to stress so much about hiring the highest skilled people. I just had to hire the people that could listen the best and that could actually adapt. Now we're in a different phase now where skill set is uh, far more respect and far more necessary. But I think the take home point is maybe remove your ego. If your job can be done by someone less skilled than you for less money, it would be ideal to do so from a scale perspective. Um, if you can outsource admin, if you can outsource finance and, you know, they, they just have a system to follow. They don't have to be the best, especially when you don't have capital to invest in the best. They just need to have a process that they can follow and they can tick boxes. If you can hire people, if you can find people to tick boxes for you, if you just free up mental capacity for you to do the thing. And then when the time comes to use capital appropriately to get the best people, you can do so. Um, as for the well, landscape now... I think it's very, very different. I think a lot of seasoned coaches probably have a little bit more of a, maybe an ego or a, a little bit of a distaste to the, where the, where the current landscape of the fitness industry is because they only, they know what they know and they know what built them right now. Most of the people that have been in the industry, as long as I have anywhere past, let's say six years, right. They have this attachment to, you need to build skill, build skill set in the gym one-on-one -on -one with people, which I agree with like, that is the best way to get reps in. It's the best way to get people skills. It's the best way to get rejection, all of the above. However, if you were coming into this industry today where you could step into an online model and that is what is normal and what is done, 
and you could probably grow faster without the outgoings of rent in a gym, would you not do that? Of course you would. All right, so I don't think it's fair to get angry at the industry of where we are. I think it's just a change in times. So when I first started, I paid $300 a week in rent to work in the place that I worked. If I was starting now, I would pay $300 a week into education to get good at what I needed to be good at and skip the, and essentially play leapfrog, skip the queue. Rather than do the 12 months in the gym, I do the six months of getting every single person that will teach me the people skills, go find the people that will teach me how to speak, go find the people that teach me how to program. If I spent $300 a week on every single week on education, you'd probably get just as good way faster. You talked about systemizing things down to the, like the, 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 the idiot level as it were. And I found it really interesting that you, you brought a system even of communication. You contrasted that with talking about freeing up bandwidth to like be creative within your business, right? Get rid of admin, get rid of finance, get rid of, you know, box checking activities that someone else's pen can strike. Is it hard to find the balance between syst- like system and creativity, structure and creativity at a level where, you know, you, okay, great. You, you've, you've bought back your time. You're, you've restructured the business, um, what I would assume to be numerous times over so that we can keep overcoming these hurdles. You sit back and, uh, you know, I'm assuming there's a reflection. When you get into the process of, business development or strategy development or brand building when you are being creative and you're in this what I'm assuming to be an unstructured territory is it unstructured territory like when you go to think about what the business how that moves to making decisions what is your structure around the more reactive parts of business or are those even too systemized I think when it comes, it is it is unstructured when you look at it from a position of actuality of the react the reactivity the reactiveness of the actual process. You have to look at what's in front of you. You can't just structure out a plan that may, may not be in front of you yet. However, the way you think about that can be structured. So I apply a framework that is very very simple, and it's think of it like I said, Venn diagram. On one side you have can do, on the other side you have should do. And if there is a cross section in the middle, that's where we start our innovation. And that's where we start to go, okay, well, let's let's structure and systemize off that cross point only because there's a lot of noise outside of that. There's a lot of things we can do, a lot of things we should do, but not many that often cross over in the exact same time. So, for example, should a coach produce their own app to deliver their service and own the IP? Yeah, they should. But can they? Probably not because they don't have a million dollars in free capital. So it's not worth worrying about. We need to find something else. There's always a lot of noise in the decision-making framework and a lot of things you can do, but not many things that you can and should at the very same time. So if you can find that cross-section, if there's a hundred things on the board, but there's only three things in the middle that actually cross over in that point in time, it gives you your direction, gives you your north start, and then you innovate off those and create systems off those few things as opposed to you know, trying to find things off a giant list and trying to just jump from new thing to new thing to new thing until something sticks. Now, in your experience as, you know, in your own business and obviously in the mentorship space, you've been doing that for, for longer than most people realize that that space has been around for, um, what are, what is the overlap? Like, what are the common things that creep up in the can and should do category for coaches looking to scale their business? Data. I think coaches, we're the worst at it, but the best at the same time. We have clients, we track all their data, we'll track their body weight metrics, we'll track their, all of their variables week by week, and all the objective data is there for you to make subjective decisions, right? There are, there are objective, correct ways to do things and maybe less correct ways to do things in coaching, but your subjective nature, your subjective skill set will dictate the direction you take. Now, why don't we just apply that same thought process to your business? Get all the objective data so you can be less emotional and make better decisions so the data that I'd be you know, most concerned about is the lifetime value of the customer, the average dollar cost of which they spend every single week, their churn rate or attrition rate, so on a month by month, how many people are leaving, and then what's your acquisition total as well. Uh, and then lastly, maybe your sales conversions. If you can just track those five things, your business will tell you the direction or the, the gaps that you need to plug. And it can be as simple as if you have, let's say, 100 people inbound that inquire in a month, and you're from inquiry through to booking rate is only 50%. So there's only 50 people that actually inquire that follow through to make a booking. 
if all you did was fix that 48 hours from when they inquire to when they could possibly book and improve their nurturing sequence, improve like maybe it be simple email marketing, it could be manual labor where you call them and just make that experience better. You just improved that 50% and lifted that up by let's say 20% and lowballed it. You now have a 70% more people. So you have 70, pe 70 people coming to your booking. And if nothing else changes, you've increased your sale rate by 20%. So in the current space, the, the shiny red ball is always social media, right? And, mm -hmm. you know, with, with coaches almost like keeping up with the Jeffersons, right? Like, you know, peering through the window of other coaches, whether, you know, their success is earned or rented kind of up to you to discern that, but how, at what point, because I, I think it would be, I think we're at a point where the idea of content as a pillar within a business to a certain degree in our industry is undeniable. That's my, like, that's my very pedestrian business understanding. At least it's a, it's a part of our business development, organic growth strategy. How do you field the conversation around content creation for people in the fitness industry looking to scale their business? That's a good question. I think you need to understand one thing first before you go down the road of content creation and production. You mentioned they're peering through the looking glass of other people on social media and essentially trying to find what works and find the stickiness in what other people do. And if you play stupid games, you'll get stupid prizes. And at most of the time, all the people that you're looking at they're getting the stupid prize. They're getting the shitty clients. They're getting the people that have problems. They're, if you use the, you know, the stereotypical influencer that is marketing, you know, a low tier product, maybe it be a um, short term process and you can sit there, you know, well, how are they more popular than me? What are they doing right? Why do they get the clients? And you can play the victim in that. And that's fine. And I know a lot of people that do. And it can be really upsetting, really frustrating, especially if you're a coach that respects education, you put a bit of time into your business, you care about people and you want to actually give back it's very easy to want to play that game but if you do you'll get the really bad clients you get the ones that have low cost high churn not dedicated etc so rather than focus outwards on what's going on with other people's content and how you can try and find stickiness i look at it from a perspective of just find you and if you can get really good at playing the character of you now everyone plays the game, like everyone's playing a status game right whether it be high status, low status, it's all association to their personal brand and who they are. So if you can find your own and play that character, uh, it becomes a little bit easier to do so and find your, find your groove with your content. And then once you've found your groove, you ultimately just need to do more. It's never a concept of find new things to post about. If you just do more and only more, you will find a feedback loop of better information, uh, figure out what works faster, and you'll be able to test and get a, a feedback loop that actually tells you, hey, confirmation bias, your, your content's working. And when I say more, I don't mean like go from three posts a week to one post every day. It's like, okay, find your actual ceiling of content creation and production and look at this as a total and if, like relate it back to coaching. Total volume is the thing that most of us will track. And yet in content, we get obsessed with the individual load of engagement or awareness that comes with one single video. What about a total volume? If you just tripled your production, total volume of acquisition or awareness or, or all of that over a seven day period. It, like all of these, and this is where I think fitness and there's always a transition from, not always, often a transition of fitness coach that uh, is less successful, doesn't find their path. They move into business coaching because, hey, I can, it's easier to tell other people what to do than what I'm doing it myself. And if all they did was just take their business of what they do with clients and applied all of that to their work, they would find more success anyway. Just, measure total metrics rather than singular. If you can remove that ego to, to one piece of content and go, well, how much engagement do I get off 30? Make some better decisions. Yeah. I always look at it like a, the way a VC would invest, you know, hundred million across 99 companies that you'll fail. But if you're Peter Thiel and one of them is Facebook, well, you'll take an L on 99 million. Yeah. Uh, you, you, you know, you, you mentioned something that I, w I was hoping we could strike on and that's, the failed business owner turned business coach, which obviously, you know, you as a business owner have been, you know, wildly successful on so many endeavors, both personal and, you know, again, in, in the shadows and that I'll, and I'll, I'll be the first to vouch for your, your, your wisdom and acumen in the, in the space. 
you seem to be someone who runs their own race, which is obviously like a, a respectable attribute. <sighs> there are going to be coaches that listen to this that go, I need help. And they don't, if they're at that point, a lot of times desperations involve stagnation in their, in their business, their client acquisition process, maybe even their systems at a programming level, maybe their education or their inability to find their own voice, anything that you've touched on so far. Um, each one of those probably could be, you know, marginally improved and have a big impact on their bottom line. Now in this, let's call it more desperate state, desperate times call for desperate measures. There's a lot of people out there looking to take money to tell you how to make more money. And the number one hmm. rule in making more money is spend less money. If you want to make more money, what is, you know, you've been around this space for a while and you've seen it through a lot of lenses and you wear a lot of hats in the appraisal process of a coach who might be in a position where like their business isn't where they want it to be. What are some, let's do a motivation. Thing. Let's do a push pull. What are things that you should be drawn towards and attributes you should be looking for when looking to bring someone on to assist you with your business? And then on the other side of it, what are some things and some attributes, buzzwords, activities, practices that you should run away from when it comes to appraising people who are, you know, potentially just trying to make their first successful business as a business coach? Yeah. I think if we, uh, if we liken this back to a quote in School of Rock, those that, don't, those that can't teach, teach Jim. Right. It's a very similar situation, right? For a lot of coaches that, that get into this industry, they go through their thing, they go through the process and they find out like, Hey, running a business is fucking hard. It's really easy to tell other people to do this. I'm going to do that thing. Um, go down the road. If you're looking for someone that is actually doing the work that makes the majority of their revenue in business from doing the thing they're teaching you rather than, uh, teaching up the chain. I don't have a problem with people. Let's say, Let's say someone's only earning fifty thousand dollars a year, right? Uh, in Australian dollars or so, in US maybe what twenty five, twenty eight thousand dollars. If that's what they're earning, that's cool. If they're going to teach people below them, they're going to teach people from the start how to make twenty five k. Great. Each down the line, it's fine. But if there's no point in someone teaching you in the business mentoring space, whether it be marketing, sales, acquisition, all the rest of it, there's no point in finding someone to teach you if they haven't walked the road ahead. So I would be asking for, for, or at least doing some research as to what skin in the game do they have? How long have they been doing the thing? Is there tangible proof that they have built a thing on their own in the, in the industry you want to actually look into, the industry that you're trying to walk through? Uh, and then secondly, if there's things to avoid, it would be one, if I, like, I'm always of the opinion that a conversation should never cost anything, especially an initial one. If someone's just trying to ca get a cash grab, the initial talk, like, hey, like, just to talk to me, you have to pay me. Um, one, either they're way too far down the line where their time has become so valuable that they don't see any point in speaking to someone below, or it's a cash grab because they're not confident in their systems and service. Second to that, when I, I, I firmly believe mindset comes into business, it, it's a part of it. But if that is the only thing that someone can teach you is to how to have a better mindset in your business, how to look internal, um, and not actually have strategy, but have everything up in the, in the wazzy woo of, you know, everything's great. If that's all they're going to talk about, that everything comes back to your mindset and they're going to throw cold plungers at you and say that you need to look at your internal work and everything becomes like personal development, probably not going to help with business strategy. You need people that can actually go down the road of what is strategy? What is like, how do I look at data? How do I interpret data? Because it's good and well for me to say, hey, track your numbers, but what do you do with those numbers? And having a framework to work with that will be the thing that shifts you forward rather than looking internal and thinking about mindset. Yeah, you can light incense all you want. And at the end of the day, you're really just blowing smoke up your ass. So, uh, yeah, Absolutely. it's always tough. And also, like, you want to talk about qualifications. It's like at a certain point, you might just want to talk to a qualified psychotherapist and, or a cognitive behavioral <laughs> therapist or something. Because if someone's telling you to do that and that's working for you, it's like imagine if you hired the services of an actual professional. Um, mm -hmm. you talked about teaching down, which I think is, you know, mm -hmm. and I see this from an academic standpoint, you know, with our business being kind of squarely rooted in the, uh, education space. I see a lot of competitors that are fifth graders teaching fourth graders, which is like, okay, fine, sure, mm -hmm. whatever. Um, but as you ascend, the air gets thinner and there's less people climbing at your level. 
I'm gonna run an analogy by you that I, that I like, and it's something that again I don't give business advice nor medical advice, so don't actually so don't listen to anything I say. And now that I think about it, you should probably just shut this, <laughs> this thing off. But, but I think about like uh, I think about the chemical bonds and valences, right? And I, which is funny because I fucking hated chemistry until I started making drugs, and then it was like I liked it enough so I didn't burn my fucking house down trying to make steroids yeah. in my bathtub. But like after, other than that, chemistry go fuck off. But it's like the idea <laughs> of you know. You, there's the nucleus, which is, you know, which is you and finding your voice and, and the thing that only you can do at, you talked about that from like a brand, personal branding perspective and a content creation perspective. Then we have these valences, right? Just like, you know, if we go through the periodic table, hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and so on, right? And if we remember the structure, the, the you know, uh, the nomenclature, the, the structure of these Bohr diagrams, we have a nucleus and then we have a first valence and that has two electrons and we have you know a second valence and it has eight electrons and every valence after that will fill up until it gets to eight electrons and i think of you know tasks in a business like i knew right away that i fucking hated the media side which is hilarious because i'm looking down the barrel of a four thousand dollar camera i got some stupid studio light that apparently i paid too much for because it keeps turning off uh and you know we're both looking down these mics that joe rogan had and that's why everyone has them and i got a laptop here and i got a screen there it's like for a guy who hates technology it's like this office, alone, literally my landlord messaged me. I just moved to this sidebar. I'll get back to the chemistry thing in a minute. My landlord messaged me. I just moved into this new place. And he goes, hey, man, they haven't transferred the, the electricity bill over to your name yet. So I keep getting the bills. It's my second month. And he sends me it. To, he's a cool guy. Like He sends me an email. He's a lawyer. He's in the tech space. We get on really well. And he just goes, I've been renting this place out for some time now. I've never seen an electricity bill this high. Are you mining Bitcoin? Like serious question. And I was like, nah, mate. I just got like this through the lights. It's all it's quite literally a whole production. But I knew early days that 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 was an outer valence task. Now, when you knock an electron out in outer valence, there's not a lot of energy that gets expended, right? But you know, in the current landscape of our world today, some people might be familiar with the chemistry of thermonuclear weapon. There's a valence that's closest, there's an electron that's closest to the nucleus and the inner valence. And if you can fucking displace that single electron, like what a, basically what a hydrogen bomb is, there's a lot of energy that gets released. And I like that visual because, you know, as I took media off my plate, I realized, well, okay, I did it for a long time and I actually got like pretty okay at it. So now I can like appraise the next guy coming in and say, like, hey, what's your ISO at? Or what's your frame rate at? Or how many frames per second are you shooting it? Or like, you know, is that a mirrorless camera? What type of lens is that? Oh, it's a... Is 75 millimeter, 25. Oh, it's a 50. Important. Okay. So I had, but no skin off my nose to get rid of it. Then I got rid of it early. But as I progressed through you know, business ownership and actually started to realize that I didn't have a job for myself, that I, that I was looking down the barrel of actually owning a business, it became harder and harder to knock off these tasks. You kind of, you kind of alluded to it earlier about ego. It's like, well, I like being like, I remember my, uh, you know, a close friend of mine and, and a coach, probably one of the first who's taught a course outside of me in the, in the thing uh in the thing in the company was killian and i remember mm -hmm. the time the first lecture happened without me there and i was like you know part of me was like oh this is gonna blow up and then everything was fine and i was like wait a minute where 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 am i the company doesn't need me to teach lectures anymore what is it so those are my inner valence thing then it becomes more difficult and you know i have to be more introspective you know more ice baths and incense up my ass joke uh, about what are the things that I do every day to you know buy my time back? What is it at your scale, at your level, with what you have on the horizon? What are the things that you know? What are your known unknowns of things that you're like, I gotta stop doing this, but there's part of me that just doesn't want to give it up. Uh, right now, I'm in the place where it's team management. So we're in the process of like early into next year, I'll be moving into uh, upper levels of management to have teams below rather than just the coaches all reporting into me and having, um, I guess the weight of all of their clients and all of their customers, the success metrics and stuff, uh, being me that interprets them. Uh, the next thing for me will be actually hands off on like team management and team process. Um, I think though, for me, like that's something that one, I don't know if we're ready for, I think that'll be the next thing, but I don't know if I don't know if we're ready for it yet because I haven't gotten to a place where I feel comfortable with where the teams are as far as our systems around culture, our systems around internal culture specifically, um, what's repeatable and what's not, and ultimately key man syndrome in the business. Um, that's something that I feel like we need to pay a lot more attention to before I start upper level of management. 
essentially to try and remove that that stickiness from client to coach exclusively that needs to still be there but long term we need the client stickiness to maintain to the company if there is a, is ever a churn rate of coaches if there's ever a change of systems or service and process that brand equity will hold true and be the thing that keeps us stable and that's right now our big problem solved so i feel like for me that needs me in the team that needs me knowing what's going on to figure out that problem but once we do that the the next known thing for me to exit from would be that management and just hiring a general manager, senior team that they all report into. What has been the diff- most difficult one so far to, to let go of? If you had asked me that a year ago, I would have said the coaching itself. I, I think it, like when I made that transition initially to move into running the business rather than being technician in it, it was a big ego thing to, for me to hold on to. I didn't think that I could step back completely. I had like I had clients that had been with me uh, nine years, and I didn't want to let go of those people. I thought that those people would be best served with me, even though like I was at the time not a great coach. I had gotten so deep into the business world, I had gotten more passionate about the growth of the business than the doing of the business, and I was not worth what they paid. But there was still this this subjective hold on to well, no, they. I need to keep them. I need to keep doing that. Fast forward a year from, so I stopped coaching completely, completely. So I said, I had not, I had clients that had been with me nine years and I'd only recently gotten rid of them. Maybe I'd say maybe six to 12, six to 12 months ago, thereabouts, uh, and passed them into one of the team members. So I had a, a four or five clients that had been with me so long that I just didn't want to let go of. Um, and like I said, I was pretty shit. I was not great at coaching. I was not good at the service anymore. I was just slow at replies low care factor and so on. Um, Once I got rid of those final four to five uh, and passed them into other team members, I realized that one, they got got a better service and two, I got more time back and more freedom to do the thing I actually enjoyed. So I don't think in hindsight now that was the hardest thing to let go. I think it's the hardest thing to let go of initially. The hardest thing for me though has been the finance to completely go absolutely, hey, I'm not being involved in this. Um, and let our, our CTO just take care of all the financial decisions in the company. Uh, it has been hard because it's been something that I, I create emotional attachment to different uh, milestones of the business, different uh, points of revenue or different points of profit and so on. And doing now a quarterly check-in to make me really back in or back off that and know exactly, know that I just need to keep doing the work without the, the weekly, uh, I guess, confirmation, confirmation bias that I'm on the right track. Now I get it quarterly. Now we go through all our metrics and we do some strategy off all of those numbers every quarter. And we have monthly check-ins to just make sure shit's not hitting fans and we're not fucked. But ultimately I get my my confirmation bias every 12 weeks. And that's for me being a very big like, okay, delayed gratification, do the work and then see if it actually yielded any sort of return. Been pretty challenging. Is it a, is it a phenomenon? Like, I mean, I, I find myself falling victim to very similar um you know, a very similar plight. And it's, it's almost as if sometimes a watch pot never boils where it's mm-hmm. like, it seems as if, cause it, you know, if you're looking at bottom line numbers and you're looking at margins and you're looking at obviously gross revenue and profits and, and all of the, the key financial data that would uh, indicate the health of your business, uh, it, it might actually be easier and a more valuable lens to see it through a quarterly basis because trends are going to start to emerge rather than like, well, we lost seven cents last week and seven cents the week before that. Ah, it's not a big deal. It's just seven cents. And all of a sudden yeah. you come the quarter, you're like, well, you know, these, these, it's like the frog that boils to death and doesn't realize, right. Mm-hmm. It just acclimates to the temperature of the room. Um, so I guess, have you, have you found that, have you found benefit in the challenge from a business perspective of actually going like, okay, we're seeing steady growth, stay the course rather than, oh, mm-hmm. wait, so, you know, there's, there's a down week and it doesn't, it may not be representative of a long-term trend. Uh, we're freaking out because we have this new individual data point. But have you found that zoomed out perspective useful, even though it's been stressful? I think it's um, it's a double edged sword. It's this big dichotomy between which stress is worse. Because yes, <laughs> it's stressful to step back. It's way, it's stressful to step back. However, that step back when I actually do, and I I manage to not look at the numbers and just stay the course, do the work. That's very rewarding in itself that I, I don't have to worry about the day to day. Hey, the fucking seven cents is down. I just, I, I can deal with that in 12 weeks. Um, so there has definitely been from an inter- introspective um, 
relationship to the stress has been better. Uh, it is still stressful, but I think the, the impact on me is less. Uh, but then also the business has definitely grown uh, as a result of because we've able to, as you said, let trends stay the course and then we can create forward projections off real data rather than reactive data. So, I mean, uh, you kind of to, to linger on this question a little bit more and get your opinion on the, the plights that coaches in the early beginnings of their business development journey go through. You know, letting go of the financials is the most difficult, followed maybe, you know, second by actually getting rid of you as a coach within the business, a technician within the business, as you worded it. What are things in early stages of business development that you find yourself advising on, you know, new coaches, new business owners? What are the high yield tasks that, you know, outside of, you know, maybe some basic like admin, like, hey, get a VA, manage your calendar. What are, what are some things you find yourself advising most often to give up? And maybe the ones that most often you're getting pushback and hesitation around giving up. I think there's two sides to this coin. The first is the, the conversations that I had from the coach's side. The most common that come up is how do I improve my branding, my coloring, my posting, my schedule? How do I make my feed look pretty? How do I make all of this conducive to, to lead flow? When realistically, that's the first thing that I say that doesn't matter. And even if we took it, look, really reverse engineer this back to the infancy of business. And we're talking like sub six figures first, first, like you're on the first track, you're on your first road to first milestone. All of that isn't really conducive of growth. All of the, the branding, all of the stuff like that, that is it's polished, all the polished stuff doesn't really impact whether you are turning over X amount of money and, you know, getting closer to the lifestyle that you may want to achieve. Now, that being said, if that lifestyle is a six figure business and it's, it caps out at hundred K and that's where you're happy, that's fine. I think like these conversations around outsourcing get a little bit confusing and maybe a little bit detached from where a lot of people want to be. Um, having a big business isn't always necessary. You have no, there is no forced pressure for you to grow past where you want or need to be. Now, can you have a business of multiple, multiple six figures without outsourcing shit? Yes. All right. You're just going to have to work a lot and that's fine. If that's what you want to do. If you want to have a bit of a lifestyle in the process of, you know, success of some sort of financial success and um, maybe monetary or financial status, there needs to be a degree of outsourcing uh, high leverage tasks that allow you to buy back some time for you to do either relax or more tasks with the business that will help you grow. The ones that I've seen to be the, the best in outsourcing that have the highest yield in return is actually getting some sort of customer success manager. Um, someone that can actually go through your client journey and pinpoint where potential pitfalls are. If you can't afford to pay someone to do that, bring on someone that you trust into your business to go through the client journey to tell you exactly what's going wrong, where their communication could be better, where they need more service or product, or maybe they just need more resource. Um, these things are going to give you the highest yield because it will just keep customers longer. I think so many people are obsessed about trying to find new people, whereas if you just never lost anyone, you'd be, you'd be fine. And if you can just focus exclusively on reducing that churn rate, your business will grow by default. We're, we're in an era of, and you kind of alluded to a little bit about, you know, under, like um, having a conversation around lifestyle, right? And I think that's one of the fetching things about a digital business is the, is the freedom of time and place that it can give you. Now, if you allow it, right? And, uh, you know, yes. there's, there are people, and this is kind of circling back to the original point, about you looking at time and, and I, I mean, uh, not to, to, to dwell on it, but like time is an enemy. I'm trying to think of the best way to frame this question in the sense of how do you manage the, you're someone that when I look at my capacity, my output, when from a work perspective, and I, I, I take a relatively uh, like blue collar ish approach to a digital business, probably because I just don't know enough and I just have to sit and watch YouTube tutorials and figure, figure out how to do shit. You're someone that's, you know, y your work ethic is almost counterintuitive or antithetical or counterculture to people being pursuant in business ventures in our space. Most people are doing it for the lifestyle, but the lifestyle that you have uh, cultivated for yourself is one that might mimic someone who's going to work on a in a mine in darwin or mm -hmm. on a road so you know how i guess how do you personally wrestle with the lifestyle component of it how do you advise people who want to be more passive in their business 
because obviously you played a very active role for a very long time in every step along the road. And that I, I, I would imagine if you're like me and, I, and I, in our conversations we've had, I, I find ourselves to be similar in a sense that it, it is on the backs of the hard work that you have the success. Now th mm -hmm. there are places like you even mentioned the contrast between, well, would I spend $300 a week on rent? Or is it three hundred dollars a week on learning the things I need to learn to run a successful business? And it's like, well, those are not, aren't necessarily the same thing, right? Rent in a gym isn't going to be the straightest line towards running a successful business. How do you deal with the passive work culture that's permeated the fitness business space as someone who seemingly and knowingly works very hard? I think there's this big assumption that like online business, I think it, it kind of rolls back to when online coaching first became a thing or digital business in general, right? You'd just be the the digital nomad of your friendship group that you can go there, here, there and everywhere and work from a laptop and you know live, quote unquote, the lifestyle. The lifestyle at the end of the day is a choice because if you outsource, right? If you outsource anything you, in your business and then you choose to do nothing with that time that you otherwise would have been doing, you were doing the job. Let's say you were doing the, the email replies, the admin, so on. And then you choose to do nothing with that time. All you're doing is getting a loss in that time. You're paying someone else to do something you did for free. So unless you use that time to grow the business, it is, it is by definition lifestyle oriented. You're just buying back time for you to just do whatever you want to do. And unfortunately, most people just assume that the bigger your business gets, the more you get to do that, which you can if you want to cease growth. Because if you want to sit back and do nothing until you have upper layers of management that anyone can, like you can completely eject out of the business and it can run at the same capacity, you, you're going to lose time. And if that time's not then leveraged, it's just losing growth. And that's fine. That's okay if that's what you want. But for me, I think completely counterintuitive to that because I've, every bit of time that I've bought back, I've invested back into the business. And you know, as you said, I, I've, I'm doing probably more hours now than what I ever have, but just on different things. And the, the conversation around lifestyle, I think it relates back to balance as a definition. So what is balance? It's, you know, seesaw, it's two sides of a scale, one in opposing, you know, they're opposing forces. That's what's going to create balance. You need to try and get an equilibrium of that. And it's just not realistic, in my opinion, to hope for balance. The best that you can hope for is synergy so that two, two forces just push in the same direction rather than pull in, in different ways. Uh, to find balance, you have to have, have these two opposing forces eventually push and pull to a point of compromise that you have a balance. Whereas if you just get two things working alongside each other, that you build the lifestyle alongside the business, you get to have the freedom of choice to stop when you want, have time when you want, but know the business is still moving in the right direction or in the direction you see, you see fit. Uh, and contrary, I, I guess how I've kind of coped with that is because I know there are people more balanced than me. Uh, there are multiple large large quantities of people far more balanced than me but they will they will not beat me because i'm not balanced and that that, that is by definition why i will win because i will do more do you find yourself getting pushback with the, you know the young kids these days old man yells like cop that are maybe mm -hmm. a little bit more lifestyle oriented like is there do you even attempt to overcome objection when you look at maybe lo the long term, the long play of like, you know, you've been in this for, you know, well over a decade in various capacities, wearing different hats at a various scales of all, all accounts, a successful business. Do you try and push back and have people understand, or is it something that's insurmountable in your, in your experience of like, look, you guys clearly doesn't want to put in the work. I'm not going to put in the work of someone if I need to convince them that they're going to have to work hard. No, because success is subjective. I get that. It's not, again, look, coming back to what I said in the beginning, is like wealth is not built off what you work on. It's what you own. So all of what I work on now is to build something that I can one day sell or at least sell shares of um, that then becomes passive. Now, if someone else's ideal of success is that they can be completely passive and not work in their business but take home you know, a six-figure salary for themselves, power to them. I'm happy to help them. Like If I can help them create their version of success, that's great. And I'll give you an example here, right? Like one of my, one of my clients, he, we've recently shifted into a, like a, what for most would be like an unknown, unknown, something that like they go, well, that's not even an option until you know. So he had, I don't know, roughly hundred, 150 clients. He was sick of doing the service provision. We ended up just hiring VAs into his business. They watched and learned how he communicated with clients for three months, watched every bit of mannerism, looked at all the emojis he used in his chats, 
how he spoke, what he did, created a frequently asked questions list. Now all of the communication in his business is handled by VAs and his customers think it's him. So he has now taken himself out of the business and all he does is the check-in responses every week. He's reduced his time capacity by 60%, earning the same amount of top-line revenue and outsourcing, and he's paying well. He's paying fair for these VA, VAs out of the Philippines. Um, like average market cost in the Philippines for a VA is probably eight to nine dollars an hour. He's paying close to like twenty dollars an hour because he wants them to do a great job. He wants good talent, and his outgoings now maybe across a month, four or five grand. But he's saved himself sixty percent of his time, and now he has a life. What's wrong with that? Clients are still getting what they want. Clients are getting the outcome. He's now got a life. It's his definition of success. Uh, uh, yeah. How do you wrestle with it? Because you're you're much. I think in some ways, maybe not more balanced, but you're more. Um, maybe wisdom is the word, or wise is the word. I have a general animosity towards people who make money without doing shit. Now, mind you, the ability to make more will always the guy on top. You know, it's like. Uh, the most dangerous guy in a fight is the guy who's got nothing to lose, right? Who's willing to just fucking do anything. And it's like, I think, you know, you learn that in some way, shape or fashion in your life, whether it's through business or otherwise. How do you, how do you manage the people that want both that want growth that want, you know, that want the big business that want the big paycheck, that want the big lifestyle, but they don't want the hard work. Cause that's like what I run into a lot. Like, you know, and, and I'm sure you've spoken on this in the past or have come across this, like the, the, it must be nice crowd in business <laughs> development. We're looking at, right. Cause you have, a, you have a sick facility, uh, which I, I look forward to playing in for, uh, at many weeks. Cause I'm just going to stay in Melbourne. So I look Excellent. forward to be bugging the shit out of you every day. Um, and, but how do you deal with like, you know, the, the, I don't know. I think they're bottom feeders or bottom dwellers at the very least. The people who want the get rich quick, who want the to sit back and do nothing, but also reap the rewards of having their time freed up, but thinking that they're going to operate at a at a growth trajectory rather than a loss. Yeah, I think a reality check is necessary. Like you can't like it's have your cake and eat it too. There are very few circumstances in in life that that happens by default especially in something as um, subjectively managed as business. There is so much that can go wrong, so much that you know, contrary to belief that does actually come down to luck and chance and who you know and meeting the right people at the right time. There are so many of the, so many moving parts that are genuinely unpredictable and you want to sit there and go, okay, well, let's create predictable revenue without predictable work. <laughs> it's just not going to happen. Uh, there are going to be very few and far between unicorns, but I don't operate on making decisions off what unicorns do. I try and look at the average and go forward because average data is going to be less emotional data. Um, how, like if we were to like, look, play devil's advocate, how would you do it if you wanted to do it? If you wanted to do less work, but earn good money, you would have to go down the road of potentially for some compromising ethics. For me, this would be an ethic compromise where it may be coaching in a short-term process. It may be challenge structured where you're buying, like you're creating vertical sales. So. The price point is so low that no one has to actually talk to someone. There's no horizontal process of, hey, this happens and this happens and I'll talk to someone. It's just completely vertical. Someone comes to the page, they click buy, they get an automated process. With AI integration now, it's very doable from, you know, let's say one type form where someone creates one thing and you can now have multiple different programs assigned and nutrition plans assigned as a as, as a um, automated process. That comes with capital injection. So you need to be prepared to pay a lot of money every month for all these subscription services to make all this run. And then you need a lot of people in the back end VAs to do the thing. But with complexity comes with, with scale comes complexity. And if you think it's going to be a, a ride that's easy and just sunshine and rainbows, even down that road, no way more people, more problems. So more moving parts, more problems. If you're going to go down that road there, it will come a time where you're like, you're going to have to step in and, and do the thing or at least know the thing is that's what will create. And at the end of the day, people don't grow business too, systems do. But to create a system, you need to have someone that knows the service or product or the way things are done, like the back of their hand. And if that's not you, you're going to be paying someone out the ass to get that, that level of uh, acumen in whatever you do. So 
it's the the road less traveled like what's what's easier what's less stressful is it just less stressful to do the work for four four week, four years and then outsource appropriately or is it capital intensive on the front end to build the automated thing that then just comes with problems later as you've kind of moved uh you know from fitness being the sole focus that you built a business around to business being your sole focus at large right fitness is mm-hmm. is so inundated with uh and i suppose it's true of everything but like you know uh idols oh i, I like this guy's physique i like this guy's physique oh, i follow this guy's style of program i saw this um with business whether it's you know, fitness business specifically, or just business at large, what are like companies or people in the business space that you look at and you go, okay, this is like the bumstead of the business world. Like, you know, they, these, this is like, you know, you talked about teaching down and then, uh, you know, fifth graders talking about fourth grade or teaching fourth graders analogy I use, who are the people like, you know, if you're someone who's looking to take business seriously, and I think it's true, the old saying, you are, you are the, a byproduct of the five people you spend the most amount of time with. I think that's true in the digital space. I think, you know, your exposure to these digital fingerprints leave a print on you. Uh, who are some people that you look at and you go, oh, fuck, okay, yeah, this guy's got a fucking, this guy's got a dial. I think, um, like, there's the obvious top, the top, the obvious front runners in this game of, like, your Grant Cardone, your Alex Hormozis, um, they're all great. And I spend a lot of time, you know, inadvertently with them by listening to all of what they put out. Uh, but for me, the the more strategical plays come from speaking to people that are a little bit closer to home, that run big businesses that, uh, you know, even on, in and of themselves, unicorns and enigmas that people don't know. So one of my one of my very good friends, Cyrus, he owns a company here called CarSwap. It's one of Australia's biggest uh, card resale processes, um, all digital. And him and I, we we riff pretty regularly we'll like we'll just go to the basketball together and we'll just sit there and talk shit about business and figure out exactly what's going on what are the what's going on in the the landscape of business as a whole and you know he's doing deals of millions of millions of dollars for backings and sponsorships and so on it's really cool to sit back and go okay well what what processes apply to businesses of that size that can be applied into any service-based business or any digital-based business anywhere and i think for me that's been speaking to people like yourself speaking to people that have businesses and like the the mentoring itself is a selfish endeavor for me somewhat because it allows me to shit test all my theory and go okay is this actually does this work and there's nothing i won't ever put anything in practice that i've not tried or have data on but it allows me talking to people um whether it be like big business or infancy i can actually sit there and go well what systems actually apply and all of the stuff that i listen to so whether it be like another uh you know Another great person I've learned a lot from is Professor Galloway. He's been excellent, um, has a lot of business courses, very, very good at what he does. Uh, but I think the, the, the problem that I have, and this might just be the way I think, but all of what these people far, far ahead of the game in me than, than I, they, they speak in, in large context because they're, they're talking to a large audience. But how do you take that large context and apply it to the business that's just started? And that's where I used to struggle. I, I would listen to all this stuff. I would get all this information, but take no action. And that's where I feel like so many people, if they just only took all of what they learned and just took action on one thing, right? Uh, is it Gary Keller, the book called One Thing? Great book. Uh, just focus on that. Just do the one thing. Just find one thing that you can take from their learning and try and actually apply it into your business. And you'll actually get a bit of growth. Right? Like listening to hours and hours and hours of stuff doesn't help. As we tip over the hour mark here, now you can't use Keller's thing because the one thing listening to one thing is his one thing. What would be mm-hmm. your one thing? A framework of value that can be applied to anyone and their business is a, it's a twofold, right? So one, we'll treat this as like a, a quadrant of four. Right? You've got head, heart, gut, and genitals. Know your value system and how you educate people, how you... Um, how you improve people's culture and their, their their warm and fuzzy feeling, how you make them feel like they belong. How do you keep them re-stimulated and give them new things often? Uh, and then last, how do you create status in your business? And if we take that value framework and apply it to a more better new framework, so do more of the education, do more of the community stuff, do more of the re-stimulation and then do more status and keep doing more and more and more until you can't and then just do iteration, check your data and actually adjust because like so many people just do all this stuff and then go, well, cool, it worked. I got my 10 clients. 
could you have gotten 20? Reiterate off the data and then make subjective decisions before you add new shit. Okay, we'll allow that as one. I'll hyphenate everything in the in the. the one the thing, right, I'll give you one thing. I'll make it yeah. simple. I'll make it simple. Know your numbers. Okay, I like that. Because That's if, if you know one. your numbers, you can reverse engineer from anything. If you have, and when I say no numbers, I know like let's say, you, I think ultimately know your top line of what you want. Like, what's the lifestyle you want? How many hours do you want to work? What is the money that you need to, you want to be bringing in in your business and know that and reverse engineer rather than try and build to it, have your perfect week in mind, knowing your numbers and reverse engineer everything off that. Okay. All right. Thank you for giving me the title of the episode. I appreciate your time, man. I'm looking forward to wrap it in person when we get over to Melbourne uh, in, in early January. Uh, I think th th there's a ton. I think people should listen back to this episode because even just being here uh, live, I think if you listen back to the episode, listen to the dimensionality of the way you refer to business, right? Even at the end, you talked about a quadrant system and then, but you talk a lot about vertical and horizontal in ways that most people probably don't actually understand how those principles apply. So the, you really did have like a, almost a four dimensional approach in the way that you referred to moving within a business, which is like, obviously it doesn't occupy geographical space, especially in our cases where we're just fucking, we're all pixels on a screen. But I think that's something that you know I'm going to go back and listen to again, and just the way you reference movement through different dimensions of up and down, uh, you know, horizontal, vertical. Uh, it's kind of this orthogonal system again, even in the way you refer to things, which is you know, you're almost like a you know what an automatopoeia is. It's a word that spells and looks like the way it sounds. It's oh, like that. bam, whack, yeah. whack. Yeah, it's yeah, it's a literary thing. I like analogies. It's almost like you're that because you had a very systematic approach of answering questions about mm. systems where the answers are the question. So I thought it was very like yeah. it was just layers of, of, of inception of, of, of Reese and, the, and your business mind. So I thought it was really cool, like trying to pit, see all of the, 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 the quite literally the dimensions. But anyways, man, I, I appreciate it. It's super insightful, as always, whether the conversations are recorded or not. Uh, I look forward to picking your brain. I thank you for your help and everything you've, you've helped me with over the years. Uh, and I look forward to running in person, running it back in person. Know your numbers. Reese. thank you so Absolutely. much. Absolutely. Know your numbers. Thank you, Jordan. Thank you all for listening. Um, and we'll talk soon.